general editor of the Wide American Literature, um, which is a, a role we take very honor in. Um, the Library of Arabic Literature, which we, we call now uh, for short, uh, was awarded uh, a grant five years ago to establish um, something on analogous to the low classics library for the uh, pre modern Arabic uh, Canada and Corpus. Canada Corpus something to do with. Um, the idea, right from the start, with the help of my two exec executive editors, James McGovery, Professor James McGovery, so, Chair of Arabic in Cambridge and Shokotaroa, who is a uh, chronologist. Brilliant scholars and brilliant executive editors. They um, helped uh, us uh, create the grant, which was awarded very generously by the NYU W Institute, to do something which is never done before, uh, to fill in a, a, a real hole, a gap in, 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 in let's say, in, in, in the world's culture at large, and, um, to wit, the absence of translations of pre modern Arabic texts, literature in the largest sense, sense of the word, texts that were written from, from before the 19th century. So we're talking about texts from the, the, lit, the literature that extends from pre Islamic Arabia, Arabia in the 6th century AD to, to the 19th century, which is the so called Mahda period of the, the Renaissance in the Arab world, although that's maybe a misnomer. Um, for reasons we might actually get into today. So, it's a huge corpus of literature across uh, uh, a wide variety of genres, numerous genres. Um, we call it Arabic al Maktab al Arabiya, which really means the Arabic library, and we chose purposely not to call it Maktab al Adab al Arabiya, which would mean the library of creative literature, because we are, we are not interested in, in solely translating poetry and ballet, um, the tradition of storytelling, which says a huge <coughs> corpus of, of different kinds of literature. But we're interested in making available in English new 21st century translations, um, texts from across the genres uh, of pre-modern Arabic. Uh, so we're, we're, essentially we're comprehensive in our goals and our missions. And we're comprehensive if you look at our current uh, roster of books, and they cover the various genres. Uh, we've got philosophy on the books coming. But the first book that we produced, one of them was the Epistle on Legal Theory. Uh, the Expeditions is a sera, that is to say, a biography of the Prophet Muhammad. And the other, the other book, which is one of the first to, to be incarnated as a paperback, which I think is a is, um, well, this is the Epistle of Legal Theory. And this is Lego you know, Parts 1 and 2, Parts 3 and 4 over there by Elias Gui. Um, before I, I'm not going to speak long, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted this just to show you that the, the, the basic books, the fundament of the library, are the, the, uh, the translations en face uh, of the Arabic edition. So this, of course, is what <coughs> I'm talking about when I uh, uh, a library that's analogous to the low classic library, which has been going on, which has survived uh, into its second century, actually, it was founded in 1911. So uh, these Arabic texts are edited by scholars, uh, and the English is translated by the same scholar called an editor translator, in collaboration with a project editor. Uh, and let it then by the board and by executive review. So there's a, actually quite a, a rigorous process that uh, leads to the publication of one of these books. I don't want to spend too much time um, telling you the, the nitty gritty of, of the, <laughs> the time that's spent in this, although it does seem sometimes that we make work for ourselves unnecessarily. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, these are the books. They are very scholarly books, but our, our goal is to make this literature available to the Anglophones world. That is to say, to, to the whole, to, to the globe, um, um, in the broad, broad sense. There's too little available in English of the Arabic literary tradition in its broadest sense. Um, of course, we've, there are 
schools of translations of the Arabian Nights. We've probably all read more than one version of, of, of several stories. Of course, there are oodles of translations of the Quran in the sixth century. Probably more uh, by the time I start speaking. Um, <laughs> the point about this project is it, it is a 21st century project. That means, so that means that the English that we translate these books into has to be good English, 21st century English, accessible, clear English, not what has been uh, the characteristic of, 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 this, of the style of translations in my field, Oriental study, Arabic studies, Islamic studies. Sounds a bit more interesting. It's always been an atrocious kind of English, an archaic form of English, a pseudo-archaic, what we call industry standard. Uh, an English where you're really hearing the Arabic. So what we want to do is to create texts that are written in a, in a transparent English where you're not listening to Arabic, you're listening to English. And the Arabic is there for those who know Arabic. Um, I'll see. I'll see now something about the occasion that we're here for, uh, to celebrate, and I hope uh, to share with you and propagate to the world. The, um, this is a, a quite a momentous occasion. I've just realized this having spoken to anyone else, we just uh, who's extremely happy about this. We've decided that after, the, after these books are uh, produced in their first uh, incarnation as a bilingual edition, that we will publish in, in a trimmer size, paperback, uh, English only versions of the books, which of course are also much cheaper, $15 or $17. Um, affordable, available, uh, carryable, uh, readable. And hopefully this will do something uh, to the field. We want this literature to be known, to get known, to become à la portée uh, of everybody. Um, so really we're here not to talk at you, but to share with you this, what to us is a, is a very important birth and launch uh, of a new phase in the history of literature in the West. It's a small room, we're very grateful to the Centre for Fiction for allowing us to celebrate and launch this project. We think it's extremely important. And uh, in 10 years time you will look back this day and say I was there. <laughs> <laughs> so having introduced the library, there are other things to say. I mean, one of the important things about the library is the collaborative effort that goes into everything that we do. No one produced a book like this on his or her own. Um, we've even produced a book, actually this one, All Sorts of the Caves, which is a 13th century unknown book. I say unknown because uh, no one knows about it. <laughs> the, the lucky few who um, got a copy of this, edited by Shelton Turawa. We, okay, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> uh, what Philip didn't tell you about himself is that he's just finished a book about recognition, and actually recognition in, in fiction, and that's how we met, because we collaborated on a book that was about the principle of discovering you are face to face with a secret or a person of mistaken identity. One of the great motives of fiction and common to the world, to fiction all over the written work, the world of, of writing. I'm not saying no that there, I'm not saying there are, there are no differences because, of course, we're very interested in the differences and, and in how Arabic, um, the modes of Arabic writing and Arabic literature illuminate by contrast um, some of the things that we are more, you know, more used to. So we're very, very fortunate to have here three extraordinary practitioners of the art of fiction, and very appropriate, who are going to comment on the first launch of the um, Library of Arabic Literature paperbacks. And I know I don't need to introduce them to you, but I will, because Amitav Ghosh has just published the Flood of Fire, the third of the great Ibis trilogy, um, an extraordinary magnum opus, which um, is in fact an exploration of language as well. Uh, written in English, but a cosmos of many, many um, dictions, dialects, um, colorful, invented languages, um, and they were very appropriate, I think, for the discussion of this kind of um, what this project is about. Sinan and Tho, Amitav and I share the envy um, on this platform that we don't read Arabic. So, um, <laughs> you, you do read Arabic? 
getting underway like a couple uh, two or three years ago when I first met uh, you know, Phyllis at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi and uh, I thought it was incredibly exciting uh, because uh, you know these are such marvelously produced texts especially the hardcover versions with the Arabic uh, just like the love uh, the editions with the Arabic text and the English translation running side by side and I do think there's such an important place for, uh, for producing uh, translations of that sort, especially of classic texts, because it's so interesting often. I mean, you know, I used to read Arabic ages ago, but I'm, I'm, I'm lazy. I haven't kept up as much as I should. So, but uh, still, you know, sometimes when I read a line, it's wonderful to be able to check, you know, um, of, of what you think, uh, you know, what you think you're missing or, uh, you know, whether the translator got it exactly right. And the other really exciting thing for me, you know, uh, what I should really say here is that uh, my, uh, my force of circumstance or whatever, you know, I, I lived in Egypt when I was doing uh, uh, some research there. And from that point on, Arabic literature has really played a very, very important part in my own literary coming of age. It's a curious thing because, uh, you know, uh, I'm from India and otherwise Anglophone, so uh, this sort of influence that Arabic, uh, that Arabic writing has had on me is not something that, uh, you know, happens in a very sort of natural way, if you like. It's something that I've reached out for. But so many, uh, so many major uh, Arabic books have uh, played a very, very important part in my life. Uh, for example, Tayyip Asala's Mosama Hidra al Shanal, which is one of the very few Arabic novels I've actually read in Arabic. <laughs> Uh, it had a profound influence on me when I was, uh, when I, actually when I was sitting down to write my first novel. Because what resonated so powerfully with me, with Tayyip Asala's vision of the world, was really this sort of, uh, uh, it was a transnational vision. It was a vision of people, sort of, uh, of connections that come into being across cultures and between cultures and across these vast disparities of space. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it really profoundly influenced uh, my first book, but even more, I think, my second book, uh, which is called The Shadowlands. Similarly, so many chance encounters with Arabic writing. I was, uh, I was actually in Cairo in, uh, in 2006, and uh, I was struggling then with the second book in the Ibis trilogy, uh, which is called River of Smoke, when somehow uh, Zaini Barakat, uh, Gamal of Yitani's book uh, found its way into my hands and I started reading it and it was a complete, it just, you know, sometimes it happens when you pick up a book, it just, uh, it just opens possibilities to you. 
And what was so powerful to me about uh, what uh, Gunnar Dhipani was doing uh, in Zain Zarakat is the ways in which he deployed official language. You know, uh, he found a sort of poetry in uh, proclamations, uh, in all sorts of uh, official statements. And that again had a very sort of powerful uh, influence on me when I came to, uh, when I started writing River of Smoke. But even beyond that, you know, one of the, I think Philip is absolutely right to say that what the lack of an outside uh, the Arab world is a sense of the depth of Arabic uh, secular literature, you know. Uh, when I was writing uh, my, uh, my third book, which is called In an Antique Land, um, which is, uh, you know, about Egypt, about India, uh, about Jews, Muslims, uh, uh, Hindus. But at that point, what, uh, you know, it was the great Arabic geographies that really played a very, very important part in my thinking. Ali Drisi, uh, uh, most of all. But all the sort of great geographies of that, of that period, you know, and they're such wonderful books. Fortunately, we do have those Hakluyt translations, uh, you know, which are not half bad, but they're old translations. And I'm so very happy to know that you're doing these new translations, and I do urge you to find, uh, you know, to put those uh, geographical texts uh, you know, back into circulation. So now, do you want to... Um... Yes, I mean, I think it's the, 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 the series, the library is going to provide a, a great service in, in the sphere of the way Arabic, Arab Islamic literature and culture is studied because now all these excellent translations that were not available before can be used in teaching in the seminars and all of that. But I think, I guess we have to be mindful that there are two spheres here. As you said, there are this, this scholarly books that are going to be used in pedagogy and then the wider audience of the anglophone world and of course not to repeat what has been said but um, there is an amazing uh, treasure trove which we've only touched the surface of in, and there's another issue that we can get into and that the relationship that a lot of um, Arabic speaking writers have to their own past is quite problematic because of the way they misunderstand modernity and all of that. And I'm saying that to say that I am especially happy about the El Shidiyab because that moves us closer to that problematic phase in which all of these complications take place. But I think El Shidiyab's publication is going to disorient in a positive way and reorient the way uh, narratives of literary history and modernity are generally discussed. In addition to being, of course, a great service for, for readers. But I wanted to say that, um, not to be negative, but I think the problematic when it comes is that no matter how great these translations are in the series, when these books come out to the anglophone world, they're going to be filtered by the usual filters that we know, which, again, have a problematic way of looking at the cultural past of the Arabs and the Muslims. So that's why we discussed before coming to the importance of also publishing, frankly, modern works of literature and culture, especially the ones that are not going to be published by the mainstream publishers, to then further complicate in a positive way the issue of modernity and the relationship to, to the past. Because out there or out here, uh, it is often, the pressure is often to consign the, the greatness of the cultural production of the Arabs and the others to the past. And the, you know, the modern period is either some kind of amorphous uh, void, basically, whereas, so, that's the, thing, the point that I wanted to, to get across, and that's why Shidya is, maybe this is too ambitious, but should be the, also the beginning of kind of striking a balance between publishing the pre-modern but also publishing the, the modern as well. The, the, the classics of modern Arabic literature, sorry. No, the leg of the leg does throw a different light on the 19th century novel. I mean, once it's there, in, in Hunter Davis's translation, 1855, there's this extraordinary searching, humorous, uh, 
wide-ranging work of imagination and reflection, um, it actually changes, if, I, if someone like myself who teaches comparative literature sometimes, it changes the perspective. And that throws a, a profound light on the present, which is important. And I think also the epistle of legal theory, very much in the past, you know, this sort of ancient work, but it's um, sort of seeing legal um, discriminations worked out for that care does also throw light into the present um, and the appearance that you're talking about and the cash problem. <coughs> so, Elias, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 can you uh, we all praised the, the series, so I'm not going to repeat the uh, praising. Uh, 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 of course, Philip uh, was much more basic than he got till now, but uh, 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 what, what's interesting now, I think about only the, the three books uh, published in paperback, and uh, actually what's the most interesting part of this is, I suppose, the publication of Shidiya. Uh, first, the translation of Humphrey Davis is uh, fascinating. It's very well done and accessible and readable and, uh, and uh, uh, makes, uh, makes give us an appetite to read Shidya. The second thing is Shidya himself as a very important figure in modern uh, Arabic literature. Not only because he was, I suppose, one of the pioneers, uh, maybe the, the pioneer of, of modernism and the pioneer of the revival uh, uh, of, of the Arabic language and the, uh, 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 the new language, which was practically uh, uh, forged by the, by the Nahda writers. He is actually the first one and, and, and the one who began the whole issue. But also, and mainly because the Shidya himself is a very problematic writer. His name is Ahmad Faris Shidya, so he's supposed to be a Muslim, but he's not a Muslim. <laughs> Uh, uh, his, originally his name was Fers Shidya, so he's a Christian, a Maronite Christian from uh, a village in Kisarwan uh, called Ashwood. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, he converted to Islam later, uh, so he became Ahmad. And then, and then on, on, on his uh, 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 deathbed, he went back to become Christian. So he's neither Christian nor Muslim. And, and this is why actually he is nowhere. And, 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 and we need to, and Shidya is very important to be read in Arabic because he is outside any curriculum of, of, of modern Arabic literature. Uh, uh, we begin modernism with uh, Muhammad Hassan Haikal and Khalil Jubran and the Prophet and all these stupidities. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the real modernism is here with Shidya. Uh, and now, now, I went to his village, to Ashwood. The story is that his brother was, of course, you, you must, most of you know this, his brother Asad was killed by the Maronite Patriarch because he became a Protestant. Uh, 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 and this is one, this is the main reason why Shidya left Liberty. Uh, uh, so I went to his village, Ashwood, and in, in the village he lived, used to live also the Patriarch who ordered the killing of his brother, whose name was Bulus Masad. So I went to the village to find out about Shidya. So nobody, nobody in the village uh, know anything about this man. He is nowhere. He, is, he vanished from the village. Whereas everybody, if you ask them about this stupid patriarch who ordered the killing of his brother, everybody knows the patriarch, <laughs> whose name was Boris Masad and who played, actually Boris Masad later will, will, will be uh, uh, historically important because he played a role in the in the in the uh, in the 1860 civil war, uh, uh, with all its atrocities and massacres, uh, so people remember the the patriarch who was part of this massacring procedure, which began in the 19th century in Lebanon and continues till now, and nobody will remember Ahmad Faris Shidya. Uh, 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 even even his uh, his uh, tomb, he is nowhere. He is in Hazmiye. Uh, uh, it's a neither a Christian nor a Muslim uh, uh, cemetery, so actually he's nowhere. Nobody knows where he is, but it, except if you want to make a research, which I did uh, when I was young and a journalist, so I did this for my newspaper. So practically, this man, who is very, very problematic in the sense that 
not only he was a secular, but he was profoundly secular. He was profoundly anti-religious and anti-clergy. This man began something he knew. Uh, uh, the leg, leg on the leg is a kind of a disguised autobiography, let's say. It's a, an autobiography which is not an autobiography. And, and, and actually, this is the first uh, modern autobiography written in Arabic. It is a novel without being a novel, because it's a novel without the uh, uh, paradigm, the structure of the European novel. We are supposed to write novels like, like the French. This is what Muhammad Hassan Haikal did in 1907, uh, writing Zainab, and then he's considered in all the canon that he is the, the, the first Arabic novel was written by Muhammad Hassan Haikal. Whereas this book was written 50 years before, and practically this book opens the possibilities of, of, of writing prose and fiction in a very interesting, open, uh, maybe I, 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 I mean, it's not to use the term, but to make it simple for everybody in a very postmodern way, where you have a, a, a composition of times of, of themes, uh, uh, of, of uh, literature, of language, of stories, and of very uh, 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 profound problems, which, which were written in, in the mid-19th century. I mean, I mean, this you cannot write even in France at that time, uh, about women and the freedom of women and, 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 and sexuality and so on and so forth. So we are here before a figure which needs to be restudied and to be, uh, and we have to reformulate our ways of thinking about the history of modernism and the history of modern Arabic fiction. And, and, and since this book was published by University Press and by an institute of the University in Abu Dhabi, I suppose a, 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 a real symposium about Shibya is needed now. After the publication of Leg, Leg uh, Over Leg, it's published also in Arabic and in English. And it would be very interesting for scholars, for Arab scholars and scholars who are interested in modern literature, not in Arabic modern literature. Khalas, this Orientalist uh, that you yani, are interested in the Arabs because they are stupid and Muslims and, uh, and, 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 and they are uh, exotic and khalas, it's over. <laughs> because, it's over because you can find them everywhere now, and uh, and even Putin is becoming like as exotic as the Arabs. Not only, not only, not only the young uh, the, uh, the, uh, the son, George W. Bush, who was also as exo more exotic than, than even than even ISIS. Uh, when he spoke about God speaking to him, and, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, Shidya can be can be studied now as a 19th century text based upon a, a, a great literary tradition, the Arabic uh, uh, literary tradition, which tried to, to innovate and to create something in the ways of writing prose and novels. And in this sense, I think the publication of this book as a translation of Humphrey and the work of, of, uh, of the Institute is so important and it must open ways and, and our eyes, and it must open scholarly works to, to redefine re the meanings of the terms which were imposed uh, uh, by, 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 the, by the canon which was, which was fabricated uh, 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 in the middle of the, in, in the first, first part of the 20th century. Uh, 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 to make to make a classification of modern Arabic literature beginning with uh, romanticism and, and it, 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 to, to, to reproduce uh, what what we have studied in, in French or English literature. Uh, now the other thing and the last thing I spoke late maybe, uh, uh, but never mind. No. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the last the last thing is that uh, how the publication of Shidya must be a beginning to publish uh, uh, Arabic uh, uh, literature, uh, uh, modernism in Arabic literature, and here I think what Sinan said is very important, uh, 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 to open it from the 19th century to go to the 20th century, especially dealing with figures which were not translated till now recently, and I don't think they will be translated 
يعني يعني from from the the, the poetry of the Turkish in in uh, in Lebanon uh, Lebanon and Syria uh, uh, to Badr uh, Shikar Sayyid who can who can fill a real gap not in in the in in the, in the American or English knowledge of Arabic literature, but fill a real gap of the Arabic literature in Indian <coughs> status as part of the world literature. What's the